जन्म की तरफ से उनतीसवें उन, सफदर हाशमी मेमोरियल लेक्चर में आप सबका स्वागत है आप में से कुछ लोगों को शायद पता हो कि जन्म इस साल अपने पचासवें साल की शुरुआत करी है और हम अलग अलग एक्टिविटीज इस साल कर रहे हैं हम नाटक बना रहे हैं हम एग्जिबिशन कर रहे एक एग्जिबिशन पे काम चल रहा है जो इस पहली जनवरी को झंडापुर में ओपन होगी उसके साथ ही हम थिएटर सीरीज थिएटर लेक्चर्स कर रहे हैं ऑनलाइन तो अलग अलग एक्टिविटीज अगले एक डेढ़ साल हम करते रहेंगे और हमें खुशी होगी कि आप किसी ना किसी तरह उससे जुड़ें और आएँ और पहली जनवरी को तो ज़रूर हमारे झंडापुर में हमारे कार्यक्रम में शामिल हों हमें बेहद खुशी है कि इस साल का व्याख्यान कॉम्रेड वृंदा करार दे रही हैं और सदारत कर रही हैं प्रोफेसर विष्णु प्रिया दत्त आज के व्याख्यान का शीर्षक है अगेंस्ट द पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ हीट प्रोफेसर विष्णु प्रिया दत्त जो आज के व्याख्यान की सदारत करेंगी स्कूल ऑफ आर्ट्स एंड एस्थेटिक्स जे में एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर हैं और थिएटर और परफॉर्मेंस स्टडीज पढ़ाती हैं उन्नीस से दो के बीच डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जर्नलिज्म एंड मास कम्युनिकेशन यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कोलकाता से पहले लेक्चरर और फिर रीडर रह चुकी हैं डॉक्टर दत्त फेमिनिस्ट वर्किंग ग्रुप ऑफ द इंटरनेशनल फेडरेशन ऑफ थिएटर के साथ सक्रिय रूप से जुड़ी रही हैं और फिलहाल वाइस प्रेसिडेंट हैं और साथ ही पीपल्स लिटल थिएटर कोलकाता के साथ काम करती रही हैं पीपल्स लिटल थिएटर का भी ये पचासवाँ साल है uh, तो जन्म का पचासवाँ साल पीपल्स लिटल थिएटर का पचासवाँ साल इज अ लॉट ऑफ एनिवर्सरी इज बीन सेलिब्रेटेड पीपल्स लिटल थिएटर के साथ ही उन्होंने 50 से ज़्यादा नाटकों में एक्ट करा है डायरेक्ट किया है अलग अलग तरह से जुड़ी रही हैं और शायद आप लोगों को ना पता हो अभी या पता भी हो सकता है पीपल्स लिटल थिएटर उत्पल दत्त जी ने शुरू करी शुरुआत करी थी और उन्हीं के उसमें जुड़ी रही और अब तक जुड़ी हैं पॉलिटिकल थिएटर पर उनका बहुत काम है और जन्म के काम पर उन्होंने ना सिर्फ लिखा है उस पर लगातार काम भी करती रही हैं और उनके जो रीसेंट पब्लिकेशंस हैं उनमें से सबसे रीसेंट जो पब्लिकेशन है वो इट्स कॉल्ड माया राव एन इंडियन फेमिनिस्ट थिएटर जो शायद यहाँ पर हमें मतलब लेफर्ड में बाहर रखी भी मिल जाएगी आपको आज की हमारी जो वक्ता हैं वो वृंदा करात हैं सी पी आई एम पोलिट ब्यूरो की सदस्य हैं और साथ ही हमारे देश के महिला आंदोलन की एक बड़ी और अहम एक्टिविस्ट हैं उन्नीस से 2004 तक वो एडवा की जनरल सेक्रेटरी रह चुकी हैं ग्रेजुएशन करने के बाद लंदन में चार साल उन्होंने एयर इंडिया के साथ काम किया और वहाँ काम करते वक्त जो मैंडेटरी स्कर्ट पहनने का आ, आ, एक ड्रेस कोड था उसके खिलाफ प्रोटेस्ट में हिस्सा लिया और तब से आ, ये ऑप्शन एयर इंडिया में आया कि आप स्कर्ट के साथ साड़ी पहन सकते हैं आ, तो तब से जो उनकी प्रोटेस्ट और आंदोलनों में आ, शिरकत शुरू हुई आ, उसके बाद आ, इसी दौरान युद्ध के खिलाफ बहुत सारे क्योंकि वियतनाम का युद्ध चल रहा था उसी तो बहुत सारे आंदोलन आंदोलनों का हिस्सा रही और उन्नीस में कमर बृंदा हिंदुस्तान वापस आ गई और कलकत्ता में छात्र आंदोलन के साथ जुड़ी और फिर इसी वक्त बांग्लादेश के साथ जो जंग चल रही थी उसके दौरान रेफ्यूजी कैंप्स में बहुत काम किया उन्होंने फिर उन्नीस में कमर बृंदा दिल्ली आई और शहीद यूनियन आंदोलन से जुड़ी और टेक्सटाइल मिल वर्कर्स के साथ बहुत करीबी तौर से एकदम ज़मीन पर काम किया जन्म के शुरुआती दिनों से ही वो हमें हमारे काम से वाकिफ हैं और बहुत क्लोजली हमारे काम से जुड़ी रही हैं और ऑब्जर्व किया है और उन्होंने हमेशा नुक्कड़ नाटक के इम्पोर्टेंस को इम्पोर्टेंस को समझा है और उसके बारे में हमेशा बात भी करी है सेवेंटी uh, के शुरुआती दौर में नॉर्थ जोन वर्किंग वुमेंस कॉन्फ्रेंस की तैयारी के दौरान कॉम्रेड वृंदा के कहने पर जन्म ने औरत नाटक तैयार किया जो आप लोगों में से बहुत सारे लोगों ने देखा भी होगा तो ये कॉम्रेड वृंदा के कहने पर ही ये नाटक की एक शुरुआत हुई कॉम्रेड वृंदा की एक और जो इंटरेस्टिंग मतलब मुझे तो काफ़ी पसंद है अमू फिल्म आई थी उसमें उन्होंने एक्टिंग भी करी है अमू फिल्म एक बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट फिल्म है सोनाली बोस ने बनाई थी उन्नीस के नरसंहार पे बनी है 
तो आप लोगों ने कमल बिंदा को एज अ पॉलिटिकल एक्टिविस्ट और देखा है पर एक एक्टर के रूप में भी उनको आप देख सकते हैं कमल बिंदा ने लगातार हमारे काम को इनकरेज किया है और हमारे ज़्यादातर नाटक देखे हैं और उनको पसंद भी किया है और जो भी क्रिटिकल उनका इनपुट रहा है वो हमारे नाटकों को बेहतर करने में हमेशा मदद किया है मैं अब ज़्यादा वक्त ना लेते हुए प्रोफेसर विष्णुप्रिया को रिक्वेस्ट करूँगी कि वो लेक्चर का संचालन करें शुक्रिया Thank you, Sanya. Um, I'm really honored today to be here in the 29th Sadar Hashmi Memorial Lecture. Uh, I would really like to thank Mala Malashi Hashmi, all the members of Jannam, my very dear own Kamita, and for all of you uh, who's come here, and of course, Comrade Brinda Karat, who's the main speaker today. My association with Sardar has been in very three different sort of perspectives. First, very um, you know, in a small way, I knew him personally. In 1980, um, 81, we had come here to do a play, Akla Chaluri, uh, not Akla Chaluri, Dara Kothi Bar, and Sardar was one of the organizers of this theatre festival. And I remember in an evening, just when we came, and over a very um, wonderful sort of buff curry, he and my father, Paldat, went into a long conversation about the future of political theater. This was this very important you know, intersection in 1980, when um, there were um, you know, warnings that the quality and the character of the political theater might have to change. It may not be the same as it was in the 60s and 70s, and the times were changing, neoliberalism was coming in, the idea of the individual and the autonomy was being sort of valorized, disseminated, you know, was becoming very important. And at this point, what does a leftist <coughs> cultural activist do who believes in the collective who believes in an egalitarian logic, who believes on a more equitable material distribution of wealth. And I remember this conversation went on for hours in the night, and they talked about everything. Sabda's very important assertion that we have to leave the proscenium theater. We have to leave these big spectacles because of the socioeconomic conditions it sort of uh, forces you into taking up. They discussed the idea of spectacles and minimalism in the theatre. They talked about space and circuit. Uh, the, uh, you know, the new implications of uh, what it means to have an audience who you have to go to, who will not come in masses to see your performance. And of course, a lot about the form and content. Secondly, of course, I, we all know of Comrade Sardar Hashmi as this very significant symbol of left cultural practice and its resistance, which sort of got enhanced, which has become a sort of a memory, a memorial, because of his untimely demise. And it created a sort of affective solidarity. And just now when Comrade uh, Brenda Farhat and I were discussing, we were saying that where were we the day we heard the news? And I remember that's a time when we revived this very important play called Kalol about the naval mutiny. And we were about to go up on stage when we heard the news. So this has become a sort of a memory, uh, a very important sort of um, you know, commemoration for us to continue with what we say is the political theater today. It keeps us going. It's a sort of an inspiration. And thirdly, after I came to JNU and I started working on political theater, the left cultural movement, um, the, almost the importance of what the sort of theater Sardar believed in, he was invested in, the work which Malashri Hashmi and Janam continued for so long, and what it means for the political theater today. I just do not believe that, you know, the way theater history is written, 
about individuals through these big individuals, big directors, big authors. And you know, he is greater than this, or oh, that person is greater, he's the founder of theater. I don't believe theater works that way. And I think Sabgar has left this very important message for us that theater is a collective activity. Everybody is in together. And when you create individuals out of a collective effort, this is a very uh, bourgeois way of writing history. It's very, you know, you individualize many people's collective commitment and work. And what we learn, you know, like the sort of theatre Janam does, which Sabdar was really very invested in, the idea of street theatre, that's the closest sort of genre we have to the political theatre. You can't dissociate political theatre with street theatre. Whatever the NGOs do and the others try to do, this is a sort of a generic, organic connection. And um, it sort of always explores these tensions which are so inherent in the autonomy of the individual, which we are seeing to today, how all cultural production sort of try to, you know, uh, celebrate it about this sort of um, individual autonomy, how great the individual is, versus, you know, the tension which always exists about egalitarianism, and that's what we believe in. And when we do research on this theater, when we talk and write about the history of the theater, the archive, as Sanya said, you know, how Janam has preserved its archive, the exhibition which we all are going to, you know, do. I think it's so important to understand we need different tools of analysis. We need different sort of modes of criticism to understand and write about the theater, to write its history. We can't do it in the way we do for, you know, the sort of great individual actors and the great individual directors. It requires an understanding and exploration of what I would say uh, aesthetics of resistance. It's not a mere formalistic exercise. It has far more implications. And today, when I really look forward to Kamrit Brinda Karat's talk and I invite her here, this is, you know, what we are all invested in to how do we sort of create a sort of constructive political culture against the politics of hate. So I invite Comrade Brinda Kara, but before that I would like to pay my tribute to Comrade Sattva Thank you so much. Um, Professor Vishnu Priyaji, it is so beautiful that you have the cultural resistance that you have to keep in mind. Thank you, Sanya. And for the time of the time, I would like to give you the time of 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 the time. हमारे प्रिय बहुत ही प्रिय कॉमेडियन सफदर हाशमी को याद करने के लिए कठे हुए हैं सदांजलि अर्पित करने के लिए कठे हुए हैं और उनके काम की विरासत को आगे बढ़ाने के लिए शपथ लेने के लिए कठे हुए हैं ये बात सही है जो विष्णु प्रिया जी ने कहा कि जब कोई अपने बहुत प्रिय चले जाते हैं व्यक्तिगत रूप में प्रिय हैं लेकिन जिस आंदोलन के साथ सब जुड़े हैं और भी प्रिय हैं तो याद आता है उस पल को जब हम लोग सुने कि सफदर हाशमे के ऊपर इस प्रकार का हमला हुआ कातिलाना हमला हुआ पूरे जन्म के ऊपर जिसमें सफदर बहुत बुरी तरह घायल हुए थे और एक मजदूर उनके साथ राम बहादुर भी घायल हुए मुझे याद है और मुझे खबर मिली सुहेल हाशमी से उनके भाई से हम लोग सब ट्रमेंड्रम पार्टी कांग्रेस में गए थे हमारे सीपीएम की पार्टी कांग्रेस में सुहेल डेलीगेट थे हमारे पार्टी के होल टाइमर होते थे और उनकी मैंने उनसे पूछा कि तुम्हें कैसे पता चला कल परसों मैंने उनसे पूछा तो उन्होंने कहा कि मेरी तबीयत ठीक नहीं थी तो मैं रैली से बाहर निकल के दफ्तर भी जा रहा था और वहीं मुझे खबर मिली कि सफदर के साथ ऐसे और सुहेल नहीं हम लोग सबको बताया 
किस हिम्मत के साथ उन्होंने बताया और हम लोगों को ऐसे लगा उस समय जैसे एक अंधेरा छा गया है और सुहेल और कौमी जोगिंदर प्लेन में आ गए हम लोग तो ट्रेन में थे और मुझे याद है अलीगढ़ स्टेशन पर जब वो ट्रेन रुकी तो शायद अगले कैरेज में दूसरे साथी आए थे अलीगढ़ बताने के लिए तो एक साथी ने आकर हमारे कैरेज की खिड़की के सामने खड़े होकर बोले कि सफर नहीं रहे और हम लोग एक्चुअली एक्सपेक्ट कर रहे थे क्योंकि जिस समय ये पता चला कि इतने घायल हुए हैं हमें भी लगा ये बचेंगे कि नहीं बचेंगे लेकिन आज जब हम उनतीस साल के बाद याद करते हैं मैं खुद ही अपने को सोचती हूँ कि इतना इमोशन आज भी कैसे जग रहा है मेरे में क्यों उनतीस साल बीत गए हैं लोग कहते हैं कि समय हील करता है हर वोट को लेकिन आज की दुनिया में सफ्ता जैसे इंटेलेक्चुअल जिसने कभी भी अपने राजनीति के साथ कॉम्प्रोमाइज नहीं किया कभी भी अपने असूल सिद्धांतों के साथ आगे रखकर कभी कॉम्प्रोमाइज उनकी दिमाग में ये बात थी नहीं कि एक इंटेलेक्चुअल को कैसे बैलेंस करना चाहिए सफ्तर एक पार्टीजैन थे एक योद्धा थे एक आइडियोलॉजी के लिए एक विश्वास के लिए समाजवाद के लिए लेकिन प्रोपोगेंडिस नहीं थे वो वो क्रिएटिव आर्टिस्ट थे और जो विष्णुप्रिया जी ने कहा कि उनकी आर्ट उनकी प्रतिभा ये बात सही है एक व्यक्ति के सामने सामूहिकपन हमेशा है ये बिल्कुल सच्चाई है और सफ्तर पहले शख्स थे जो इसमें जिसका अटूट विश्वास था इसमें लेकिन साथ साथ ये भी बात थी कि व्यक्ति का जो रोल है मुझे लगता है सफ्तर ने उसको प्ले किया है और मैं ये कहती हूँ कि अगर सफ्तर का विरासत आज जिंदा है वो उनके साथ ही जन्म के कारण जिस हिम्मत के साथ जिस बहादुरी के साथ उस समय भी जन्म ने तमाम कठिनाइयों को पार करके खड़े हुए मुझे लगता है हमारे इतिहास में शायद ऐसे मिसाल है शायद ऐसे मिसाल है जब दो दिन के बाद वो ही ग्रुप जब दो दिन के बाद वो ही शहीद के पार्टनर खड़े होकर वो ही नाटक करते हैं कितने लोग कर सकते हैं मुझे नहीं लगता है कि ये बहुत कॉमन है ये बहुत अनकॉमन है और इसीलिए मैं समझती हूँ कि जो सामूहिकपन है जो कमिटमेंट है वो जन्म में हम पाते हैं और जन्म ने और जो ये सब नौजवान और जो नए साथी जुड़ रहे जन्म में मैं आपको सलाम करती हूँ क्योंकि आप लोग जुड़ रहे ऐसे समय में जब आपका जुड़ना ही एक बड़ा संघर्ष है आपका जुड़ना ही एक रेजिस्टेंस का एक सिग्नल है आपके आना ही एक रेजिस्टेंस का एक झंडा है तो मैं समझती हूं कि आज अगर सफर देखते आप सबको वो कितने गर्व करते कि एक समूह एक कलेक्टिव जो उन्नीस ने जन्म लिया आज 2022 में वही कमिटमेंट वही बहादुरी तमाम कठिनाइयों को पार करके आप लोग काम कर रहे हैं और इसीलिए जो आप लोगों ने इस विरासत को जिंदा रखने का जो रोल अदा की आज मैं जन्म के साथियों को भी सलाम करती हूँ और शुक्रिया अदा करती हूँ कि आप उस संघर्ष को जो कल्चरल पॉलिटिकल एक्शन के रूप में विष्णु प्रिया जी ने इतने सुंदर तरीके से उसको रेखांकित किए उसको आप लोग जिंदा रख रहे हैं और इसलिए जन्म को शुक्रिया और जन्म को मेरा सलाम
आज का जो विषय है द पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ हेट नफरत के संबंध में और नफरत आधारित राजनीति और ये एक ऐसे विषय है जिसके बहुत सारे पहलू हैं तो आम तौर में मैं कभी भी लिखित भाषण कभी भी नहीं कहूंगी लेकिन कब देती हूँ लिखित भाषण लेकिन मैंने सोचा क्योंकि इतने सारे मुद्दे हैं इसमें और इतने सारे उसके पहलू हैं मैंने सोचा कि मैं लिख कर ही आपके सामने इसको पेश करूं दिक्कत की बात है कि ये लेख जो है ना वो इंग्लिश में है लेकिन सानिया और विष्णुप्रिया आपकी इजाज़त से और आप सब की इजाज़त से अगर आप राजी हैं तो मैं आपको पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ हेट के संबंध में जो कुछ पॉइंट्स में रखना चाहती हूँ मैं पढ़ के जो मैंने लिखा है सुनाना चाहूंगी अगर आपकी इजाजत हो तो थैंक यू सो डियर फ्रेंड्स टुडे वी आर डिस्कसिंग द टॉपिक अगेंस्ट द पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ हेट नाउ व्हाट इज द डेफिनेशन ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ हेट आई थिंक लीगली सो फार अकॉर्डिंग टू द यूनाइटेड नेशंस देयर इज नो रियल डेफिनेशन एक्सेप्टेड ग्लोबली ऑफ द पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ हेट बट अकॉर्डिंग टू द यूनाइटेड नेशंस इन जून 2019 and i quote from that document in the wake of what is defined as a global increase in xenophobia racism intolerance violent misogyny anti-semitism and anti-muslim hatred around the world the united nations felt it important to produce a document called strategies against the politics of hate and hate speech so in that there are some definitions of hate and hate speech which i think are relevant for us to understand today what they say is quote and quote on hate speech hate politics and their advocacy quote hatred and hostility are seen as intense and irrational emotions of opprobrium i hope i pronounced that right intense and irrational emotions of opprobrium enmity and detestation towards the target group the term advocacy is to be understood is requiring an intention to promote hatred publicly towards the target group and the term incitement किसी को भड़काना उसका जो परिभाषा है टू स्टेटमेंट्स अबाउट नेशनल रेशल और रिलीजियस ग्रुप्स विच क्रिएट एन इमिनेंट रिस्क ऑफ डिस्क्रिमिनेशन हॉस्टिलिटी ऑफ वायलेंस एंड दे डिफाइन हेट स्पीच एज पब्लिक स्पीच दैट एक्सप्रेसिस हेट और ग्रुप बे और इनकरेज वायलेंस towards a person or group based on something such as race religion sex or sexual orientation to isse hum log ye samajh sakte hain ki jo un ya antarrashtriya paimane par jo paribhasha hai hate politics aur hate speech ka wo ek generic term hai wo keval ek target group ka nahi wo kai mudde par ya kai aadhar par wo prakat ho sakta hai तो जब हम लोग हेट स्पीच को समझने का प्रयास करेंगे हिंदुस्तान में ये अनिवार्य हो जाता है कि हिंदुस्तान में आज हेट पॉलिटिक्स जनरल हेट पॉलिटिक्स ने हमारे देश में आज पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ हेट का क्या रूप है और उसके क्या जड़ है दैट इज व्हाट वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड इन अ वेरी पर्टिकुलर कॉन्टेक्स्ट and also we know that hate politics is not new to our history before independence <coughs> post independence we have seen so many different uh, reflections of hate politics for example on the issue of caste now caste is not a category which has been included in the un definitions but if you look at it in india's context i think the caste system is one of 
the biggest institutions which have created the whole structure of hate politics in India through the ages. But when we talk about hate politics in India today, aaj ki hate politics mein kya antar hai? Ye hume bahut sab. Aur uske liye aapko ek political understanding batane ke zaroor. Isme hate love ka sawal nahi hai. Sawal hai hate ki paribhasha ko samajne ke liye Hindustan mein aapko ek political samaj banane ke zaroor hai. You can't just describe it in terms of hate for something and love for something. So what is that? So today there are two aspects which we have to look at. One, hate politics in India is not just by this or that group or contradictions and conflicts sometimes violent between this or that group which we have seen. Today, hate politics in India is practiced by those in power, by the government in power. The RSS BJP venture, the joint venture which is in the central government today. And further, using their parliamentary majority, or you can say misusing their parliamentary majority, it is not just the government, but it is the different structures of the state itself, which is being suborned towards this goal or towards this vehicle of hate politics. Hate politics is not the goal. Hate politics is the way to meet the goal. So to understand the hate politics, we have to know what is the goal. And that is what the specific political and economic agenda of those in power today to change the very nature of the Republic of India and to convert it into the Hindutva Rashtra as defined by various <coughs> ideologues of those in power. Now, I deliberately use the word Hindutva, Not Hindu Rashtra. Rashtra, as opposed to the word Hindu Rashtra. Because I believe that Hindutva is the political project to use religious belief among Hindus to manufacture an exclusive national identity based on religion. Now, the man who Modi ji is most inspired by, Golbokar, you read his book, na? in which he says, he talks about scavenging and how it's an inspirational thing to do. And that book is dedicated to Goldwalker. But anyway, to come back to Goldwalker, this is his quote, to understand the agenda. Hate politics is not the goal, as I said. What is the goal? In this country, Hindustan, <coughs> the Hindu race, with its Hindu religion, Hindu culture, and Hindu language, Sanskrit and its offsprings, Sanskrit, as you know, being the language of the upper caste, completes the nation. All those not belonging naturally fall out of the pale of what is national. Now, if this is the understanding of what the goal of Hindutva is, the establishment of a Hindutva Rashtra, well, clearly, this is in direct conflict with the Constitution of India. The preamble of the Constitution of India, which says, we the people of India. It doesn't say, we the Hindus of India. It doesn't say, we the people of this or that caste or religion. It says, we the people of India. And this is what riles the RSS the most. Articles 14 and 15 of the Constitution, which hold all citizens equal before the law, and which prohibit discrimination on the basis of caste. Aise goal ko pura karna chaate hain. To aapke saamne mukhyata koon sa main baadha hai? 
मेरा ये मानना है कि जब हम हेट पॉलिटिक्स समझने की कोशिश करेंगे कि बाधा उनके लिए क्या है बाधा है कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बाधा है आर्टिकल 14 एंड 15 और बाधा है इंडियन सिटीजनशिप की परिभाषा सो नेचुरली टू अचीव दिस गोल द एडिफिस ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन द बेसिक पिलर्स ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन सेक्युलरिज्म democracy social justice federalism unless this edifice of the constitution is dismantled how are they going to achieve a change fundamentally in indian citizenship which is equal citizenship how can you achieve a hindutva rashtra unless you attack the basic edifice of the constitution of india and each one of these is linked to the other now you know for example that today the word secularism is considered a dirty word by those in power and this is not my saying so led by defense minister rajnath singh led by the chief minister of uttar pradesh who calls himself a yogi led by many of the others of the bjp they have very clearly said secularism is a dirty word it's a word which was included during the time of the emergency during the time of the authoritarian regime they have moved petitions in the supreme court to remove the word secularism last week a bharatiya janata party member of parliament has moved a private members bill to remove the word secularism so it their, their intent is very clear their intention is very clear attack secularism now remove it from the constitution are bhai you remove it from the constitution but the intrinsic nature of india's constitution is secular as i have just said article 14 and 15 the right to practice religion the right to propagate religion of your choice these are all fundamental characters what the supreme court has said is the basic structure of the constitution of india so when you attack and when you want to remove secularism it is not just a word which is abusive as far as they are concerned or abused it is a very concept of secularism which we all know now can you envisage an india which is democratic without secularism तो देर आर सम पीपल हु थिंक अरे सेक्युलरिज्म हटा कर क्या फर्क है हमारा तो सेक्युलर है ही तो भी हम लोग डेमोक्रेटिक तो रहेंगे हमारा डेमोक्रेसी तो रहेगा अगर सेक्युलरिज्म हम रिमूव करते हैं लेकिन ये बात नहीं है व्हाट आर बेटकर इज सेड ईच एंड एवरी एस्पेक्ट ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इज लिंक्ड टुगेदर सो सपोज फॉर एग्जांपल you give up the word secularism or you give up the concept of secularism what would it mean in terms of democracy in india i think that is something that we have to look at that would mean the introduction of religion and religious texts to determine rights so if you remove secularism if you remove equality what is going to determine it what your religion believes the majority religion will then be the basis for jurisprudence governance laws and so on and so forth and therefore those who are so deadly opposed to pakistan being a theocratic state want to exactly replicate maybe not directly but at least incrementally the introduction of religious and religious texts as the basis for the constitution of india and you will of course remember matlab jab sari duniya sare log hindustan mein constitution ka samarthan kar rahe the constitution assembly ke paar hone ke baad kisne uska virodh kiya ye to sab aap log jante hain wo organizer jo rss ka patrika hai aur unki jo itne lekh the jo aaj tak kisi ne usko disown nahi kiya hai jisme likha tha कि भाई ये भारतीयता की अगर हमें करना है तो हमारे पास इतने कानून हैं हमारे पास सबसे बेहतर लॉ गिवर है मनु हमारे पास मनुस्मृति है तो जब मनुस्मृति होता है 
तो ये विदेशी भावनाओं को लेकर ये जो कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बना है ये भारत का कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन नहीं हो सकता है सो फ्रॉम द बिगिनिंग वॉट वी अंडरस्टैंड इज द वेरी कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी एज बींग इक्वल राइट्स ऑफ ऑल सिटीजन हैज बीन एनेथमा to the bhartiya jan i mean not bjp to the rss of which the bjp is is a front of so the point that i'm i'm making here is that every aspect of the constitution is linked if you remove secularism you are attacking democracy and democratic secularism being a fundamental and basic structure of the constitution cannot be tempered with tempered with so what is the way out for bhartiya janta party who wants the hindu rashtra back the judiciary back the judiciary pressure the judiciary to accept such petitions which want the removal of the word secularism or pressure the judiciary after all you have the supreme court which is the apex court of this country which is supposed to be the ultimate arbiter of justice as and when the executive fails although of course parliament should and must be the arbiter of justice being a representative of the people of india but legally in our constitution the supreme court is the apex body for justice so now if there is a barrier in this incremental implementation of a very specific goal of changing the nature of the indian republic all those who are co constitute barriers to the achievement of this must be subverted Now this is not just a question of this or that judge. This is a basic aim as to how to subvert, to reach the goal of removal of secularism. You attack democracy, and in attacking democracy, you have to attack every single institution in India which represents any part of democratic functioning of the polity. that is the point here you cannot separate or compartmentalize the political impact of what this goal actually means so subvert the judge what does it mean when the law minister stands up not once but twice or thrice to abuse the supreme court in the way that he has ministers are going to tell the supreme court whether to accept bail petitions or not because they happen to be against what the government wants ministers or the other officials like the vice president of india is going to tell the supreme court you should do this or you should not do this you are going to make a public spectacle of your opinions about what the supreme court is so that it can be followed by all your trolls on social media what does it mean this is what it means when i say that you cannot separate one pillar of the constitution from another without damaging and dismantling the entire edifice now whether it is the judiciary whether it is the election commission of india what happened recently some gentleman was appointed to the election commission his name was suggested within 20 he was a, a bureaucrat in the government within the 24 hours of his resignation he was appointed as the election commissioner the supreme court said what is the process show us the files so if such institutions which are part of our constitutional framework which ensures some autonomy from the narrow political interests of the executive are to be subverted and subordinated to the might of the government what is going to happen to democracy in india 
So you start off by saying secularism is a dirty word and in the process of dismantling the whole concept of secularism, you destroy democracy, you destroy institutions. You destroy the very framework on which parliamentary democracy in India stands. What is happening with parliament today? It's not just a question of suspension of opposition MPs. Of course, that is an issue. You raise an issue, it's not heard, you make a noise, out you go. On every issue of concern to the people of India. There are, there are checks and balances in the parliamentary process. There is a, a, an institution called a standing committee of different ministries, which you all know about. Today, bills are just passed in parliament without any reference to the standing committee. So using your power, you are attacking institutions which form the edifice of the Constitution of India. I have mentioned some of those. And I would specifically like to mention an example of how the judiciary is trying to be suborned and subordinated. And you all know what happened to Justice Murli But I want this on record. I think, I mean, in the history of India, of course, we have seen the emergency, and we have seen the way other regimes have also tried to silence judges or to, you know, pressure them. That's all been happening. But have you ever heard of a case where a violent riot, a, a communal attacks are going on in the capital of India, where hate speeches are made which are directly linked to that violence, where not a single FIR is filed against leaders making those speeches because they happen to belong to the ruling party of India. And when a judge of the Delhi High Court calls out the police in open court, hearing the speeches made and asking them, do you or do not consider this hate speech? He was transferred at midnight. I mean, we all know this. But do we understand the significance of this? Because I think that was really the signal as to how this government, towards the implementation of its agenda of a Hindutva Rashtra, how it deals with those and institutions which it considers barriers. So this point which I am making that, you know, look at the Look at the impact of this on all aspects of the Constitution. I think these are some of the examples. There are others, but I'm, I'm not going to go uh, into all that now. And so that is the institutional aspect. Now, if you look at how this effect affects democratic rights and civil liberties of citizens. Now, if I object to, if I oppose, if I mobilize and organize certain social sections among whom I work against the government and its policies. Today in India, the Constitution gives me the right to do so. But as we have seen, those who take on the communal agenda of the RSS and the BJP are termed anti-national, urban Naxals. I mean, all my life I've fought against what I consider completely <laughs> rogue trend in left politics, which is what they consider Maoist or Naxalit or whatever it is, but today, frankly, when every single dissident is called an urban Naxal, I kind of express my solidarity with all those students who stood with banners and placards saying, look, I'm an urban Naxal. <laughs> but the point that I'm making is that democratic rights and civil liberties. Now, the way that the UAPA, for example, is being used since 2014 to 2020, 
10,552 Indians, in seven years that is, were arrested under UAPA. But among these 10,552 arrests, in all these years, only 253 have actually been convicted. You can't get bail under UAPA for years. We did an RTI in Jharkhand. We found that almost a thousand very poor people are arrested under UAP. A large number of them are Adivasis, all called Maoists and shoved into jail with no legal redress. So there's some, Stan Swami was one of the people, you know, who was arrested and who died in police custody, in judicial custody or in jail custody. He was one of those who fought against this. But the point is that you have no evidence. What is made very clear now that it is totally planted evidence using the notorious Pegasus software into the computers of those in the Bhima Kodigam case. That is the so-called prima facie evidence which has been used to arrest those activists for the last four years, many of them. So all this is the Hindutva way towards its goal, its political goal. These are the aspects of it. And we also know that it means the stifling, the muzzling of the press, the media, and we have the dubious distinction of being 150th out of 180 countries in the World Press Freedom Index. And we know how journalists who want to be impartial are bullied, are intimidated, how media outlets or media houses are taken over by corporates to be silenced. We know all that. And this is all part of this suppression of democracy and democratic rights which have been guaranteed to us by the Constitution of India. So what do we make of all this? Now you can say all this leads to the conclusion that yes, under the BJP RSS, India is an authoritarian regime. So this is one aspect, I think, becomes very clear from the narration of the facts which I have placed before you. But does it end there? No. Because the ideological backbone to this authoritarianism is communal. And today, the entire Hindutva project is linked to the creation and manufacture of an overarching Hindutva identity, which has nothing to do with religion and everything to do with the Hindutva based on hatred of other religions. Now I have, I have, uh, you know, just listed out some of the aspects of this building of the overarching communal, the Hindutva identity. Very quickly, I'm just going to go through those there four or five aspects. I mean, the first aspect is the equation of Hindu identity as nationalism. I mean, Nehru had spoken about the difference between majoritarianism and minority communalism precisely because the communalism of the majority is linked with nationalism. And we have seen in the past so many decades how this is so very true. And the core of this ideology, as we know, of linking religion with nationalism is the theory that only those for whom the fatherland is Pitrabhumi is also the holy land, Punyabhumi, can be accepted as children of Mother India. So Pitrabhumi and Punyabhumi. And this effectively excludes Muslims and Christians from being citizens of what Savarkar described as the Hindu nation and Rashtra. 
And if we see the way this ideological uh, assertion is implemented, we have seen how RSS propaganda is that Muslims naturally identify themselves with Pakistan. The demonizing of the Muslim community as being terrorist, anti-national, rapist, criminals, and so on, is all part of the propaganda to strengthen this majoritarian approach that Muslims cannot be loyal to India even though they are Indian citizens because of their religious affiliation to Islam whose headquarters of worship is Mecca. Thus, to be Hindu is to be nationalist, to be Hindu is to be Indian. Now forget the murderers of Pansari, forget Gulbaji and Gauri Lankesh being murdered by those whose affiliation was to Hindutva ideology, forget the Maligao bombings, the Samjhota Express bombings, in all these cases and more, terrorist groups linked to Hindutva ideology are the accused. Do you remember Asimanam and his revelations as to how the RSS and its leaders were complicit in all these terror attacks? He retracted it later on, but it's there on record. Forget all this. Forget that Muslims were equal partners in the freedom struggle. Forget that as part of the defense forces, they were as responsible for protecting India's security. Forget that our cultural heritage is rich precisely because it is a representation of pluralism of so many different cultures. Forget all this. This is the bedrock of Hindutva. Its slogan of cultural nationalism is a cover for religion-based communal identity politics. And of course, we know this has also had a response and a retaliation from some sections of the minority communities who have taken to the propaganda and to the efforts of fundamentalists within their own community to manufacture the so-called Muslim identity in so many different ways, which are extremely damaging to the democratic rights of, for example, women. Muslim women. But this identity of the Muslim identity by Muslim fundamentalists actually benefits only those who are most benefited by communal colonization, <coughs> which is the RSS. The second project is of colonizing and communalizing the mind. Now, the Home Minister of India, Mr. Amit Shah, I mean, whenever I think of Amit Shah, I just see a bulldozer. <coughs> I mean, really. I mean, whatever he speaks, whatever he says, whatever he represents to me is that bulldozer which is just determined to destroy everything good in its way. So anyway, it's this <clears throat> Mr. Bulldozer Amit Shah who gave an open call recently uh, to historians. You may have seen that, Mr. Priyaji, in which he says you will have the backing of the central government to rewrite our history. Now, think of what that means. What does it mean to rewrite our history? That is, to teach our children the falsehoods and distortions that our history is a history of Hindu versus Muslim. That the Muslim, the, the, the Mughals, that they were Muslims, who are coming to impose Islam on India to destroy Hinduism rather than conquering armies successful because of local alliances with Hindu feudals and monarchs. For them, all Hindu emperors and kings are wonderful, even if they burnt their citizens at the stake. And all Muslims were evil. The caste system was nothing but a distorted division of labor done by the Muslims, that Manuspriti is the greatest law book of all time, that Khap Panchayats are benign institutions of social reform. You know the UGC has just issued a circular to all of you. Vishnupriya, have you got it? Saying that please include the wonderful role of Khap Panchayats. 
institutions which the Supreme Court has said you should prohibit. They, they want to glorify it. And etc. etc. So this is an assault on the heart of India, on the shared cultures, as also the distinct cultures of multiple social groups. Pluralism, distinction, diversity, not the RSS credo of uniformity. The third aspect of this creation of Hindutva identity is for the RSS one of the most difficult and complicated, which is its commitment to Varnashram on the one hand, and secondly, its attempt to build an overarching so-called Hindu unity. So how do you do that? So what is the way that they do it? It's interesting. So this is sought to be achieved by promoting identities of various castes and subcastes. For example, specific subcastes among Dalits are identified, histories of leaders, cultures, etc. are studied and used to promote a distinct identity of the subcaste and pride in that identity. However, that identity remains within the four corners of caste hierarchies. So you're proud of your Balmiki ancestor, but you remain proud at the level that you are in the toxic caste system which is India. The commitment to the caste system is seen crudely in the Ghar Vapasi movement. Converts who are mostly coercively forced to return to the Hindu fold are inducted with their caste intact at the lowest rung of the hierarchy, whether Dalits or Adivasi. The fourth aspect of the building of this overarching Hindutva identity is also that for Hindu believers, unlike other religions, there is no one God or one holy text, such as the Bible or the Quran. So the crafting of an overarching Hindu identity sort of gets diluted by the existence of 30 crore or so Hindu gods and goddesses, each of which have their own cultures, their local cultures, their local ways of worship and practices. How do you build one Hindu identity when you have so many myriad local practices and cultures of believers in Hinduism? So what is being done there? This is also being flattened. And how is it being flattened? By the building of hierarchies among the gods and goddesses themselves. By the propagation of observances of festivals, which were never there in other parts of India. We have never seen Ram Navami being observed in Kerala or the South. Or even, for example, even in Bengal. It was never there such a huge cultural festival. But here you have huge amounts of money and organization being expended by those in power precisely to build this overarching Hindu identity which actually bulldozes. And that I think is also a cultural bulldozer because those festivals lead to so many other aspects of expression of belief. So this is all done within the general framework of Hindutva and the Brahminical Manovadi basis. So if this is the creation, I mean, some of the aspects of the creation of the Hindutva communal identity, I'm sure there are many more. But I think one very important aspect that we have to look at is, what is the economic aspect of Hindutva? I think that is very important for us to understand. And here in India, I don't know whether there are any similarities with what happened in Germany, but certainly we can say here in India, by and large, this has the backing, including the financial backing, of the most powerful business houses in India. And here is a point you may want to consider when we talk about hate politics. As far as the economics of it is concerned, 
is not hate but love to our gender. But love for whom? It's corporate love. It's not universal love. It's not universal brotherhood. It's corporate love. I mean, what, for example, how would you describe the process of making an Indian businessman, Adani, the second richest businessman in the whole world? I mean, that's not hate, that's love. <laughs> and that's a particular set of, and a framework of policies. But there is hate in that too. And that is expressed in the huge economic inequalities which exist in India today. So this is, I don't know if you can call it the Jekyll and Hyde of Hindutva. And what happens to those? What happened last year in the number of suicides? 42,000 of those suicides in India, 1,64,000, 42,000 were the single social group of migrant workers, of unorganized workers, of daily waged workers. 42,000 committed suicide last year. A large majority of women committed suicide last year. Who were they? Were they Hindus? Who were they? They were workers. But if you look at it through the prism, of what Hindutva wants him to do. Does any BJP leader stand up and say, what is the difference between a Hindu who is rich and a Hindu who is a poor migrant worker who has no other way but to commit suicide? This is a fraud of this Hindutva identity. And this is the pinnings of the economic agenda of what Hindutva is. And this also, to a great extent, conceals the universal identity of all the oppressed, the class identity. And this, of course, suits corporates. And therefore, when we look at the politics of the Hindutva agenda, we also need to see how fraudulent it is as far as the, even if you go by their definition, which obviously I don't, is that the large mass of Hindus ruled by Hindutva modern Rajas are now part of the most unequal, one of the most unequal societies in the whole world. So if you look at this aspect of the architecture of Hindutva, then we see how it is being implemented. Now many of us, when we talk about hate politics, we see the violence against minority communities. And I would like to quote from what Bilkis Banu said when she filed her petition in the Supreme Court. She said, the decision to once again stand up and knock on the doors of justice was not easy for me. For a long time, after the men who destroyed my entire family and my life were released, I was simply numb. I was paralyzed with shock and fear. This is not just an individual voice of a single woman. Bilkis Bano cannot be separated from what is happening to a whole community of Indian citizens. Let's not fool ourselves that we can talk about being political against the politics of hate without recognizing and accepting that a substantial population in India 
is not, does not feel itself safe in this country. And everything which I have said, everything that I have related in the architecture of Hindutva, how is it implemented? I have said, and we believe, you cannot de-link things. You cannot think that today minority rights or a whole community believes and is under siege without understanding that you yourself are under siege. Your country is under siege. Your constitution is under siege. The very basis of democracy is under siege. Your economic rights and social justice is under siege because Minority rights are an intrinsic part of this whole edifice of the Constitution. You knock this out, you knock down the entire edifice. Please, we have to remember this. And the reason why I want to emphasize this, because there is such a large section of liberal opinion in India which believes, Chalo ye minorities ke saath ho raha hai, itna to nahi ho raha, thoda kam yaha ho jayega. Chalo ye to RSS ki bhagwat ne to kahi diya hai ki musulman bhi humare bhai hai. Kahi diya hai na, to ye sab kya hai, joh ye log sab kar rahe hai, joh maar rahe, peet rahe hai. Joh khule aam ek pillar par baanth ke, gujarat ki polis kisi ko maar maar ke, puri janta ke saam ne kar rahe hai, log taliya baja rahe hai. ये तो एब्रेशंस हैं क्योंकि भागवत जी ने तो कह दिया है कि भाई मुसलमान भी इंसान और सिटिजेंस हैं कितनी बकवास है व्हाट इस द रियलिटी टुडे माय डियर फ्रेंड्स लुक एट द पॉलिटिकल इकोनॉमी ऑफ इट ड्यू नो इन कर्नाटक आफ्टर दिस होल हिजाब बैन एंड व्हेन मुस्लिम्स एंड अदर्स प्रोटेस्टेड in large parts of Karnataka, where religious festivals have melas alongside with fairs and shops, etc., they officially passed a ban against Muslim shopkeepers to open their shops there. Do you know today of security agencies right here in the capital who are not employing Muslims because they say their clients will object if a Muslim is a security guard? Do you know the number of domestic workers today who are forced to change their name. Because if they go and work in a Hindu household, somebody the other, if not their direct employer, somebody the other in the building will say, are in ke ghar mein to musulman are. So the political economy and how it impacts the working people, that is also a very, a very cruel reality of this whole structure of targeting of the Muslim community. And communal violence is intrinsic to this agenda. It is not the only form, but it is intrinsic to it. And I just want to say that through the years, all this nonsense about who is responsible for the violence, forget what we say. What do Judicial Inquiry Commission say through the years? I want to put this before you. Justice Jagmohan Reddy report in 1969 Ahmedabad violence. Justice D.P. Madan report on the communal violence in Bhivandi, Jalgaon, Mahad in 1970. Justice Joseph report on Telecheri violence in 71. The inquiry report into violence in Jamshedpur in 79. The Venugul Rupal, uh, Gopal report on violence in Kanyakumari in 1982. The Sri Krishna report on Bombay violence in 1993. And of course, the Liberhans Commission report on Ayodhya and the destruction and the demolition and the raising of the Babri Masjid. In each and every one of these cases, who have they held responsible? These are reports. After inquiries and investigation, not that nobody else was responsible, but who are primarily responsible? 
It is the RSS and Hindutva outfits. So violence is in the DNA of this Hindutva agenda. <clears throat> and it's violence primarily against the minority communities of India, the Muslims of India, although, of course, in many, many areas, particularly in Adivasi areas, we see how the Christians are being attacked. We see how churches are being raised to the ground. We see how prayer meetings are disrupted in the name of being conversion ceremonies. So yes, <coughs> hatred is reflected in the anti-minority violence in which the Supreme Court itself has expressed concern in a recent petition which they were hearing in October this year. They have mentioned the climate of violence in India. They have mentioned the importance of those in power to take strong steps against hate speech and those who give hate speech. This was in October, my dear friends. And what happened a month later? There were the elections in Gujarat. There were the elections in Madhya Pradesh. There were local elections in Delhi. What did we hear? What did we see? Did they bother about the Supreme Court? Did they bother about their judgment against hate speech? The Supreme Court has said, take sua moto notice against those who are purveyors of hate in their public speeches. But what happened? I want to speak about this because it doesn't only affect minorities. Look at the way it affects every other section. And I tell you, if there was any court which had to take suo motor notice, it's not political leaders. I want to ask why courts are not taking suo motor notice? There are laws. 153A, 153B, 295A, 506 of the IPC. Well, Supreme Court has listed all that, saying take sumo motor notice. But when they do it, who's taking sumo motor notice? And what is the best example of this? The Shraddha Walker case. You know about that case. What did the Assam Chief Minister say? Ever heard of something more outrageous, more objectionable than his remarks? Vote for Modi to prevent Aftabs being born in every city or living in every city. This is the chief minister of a country, uh, of a state, making a statement like that. Aftab is a criminal. He has to be arrested, he has to be punished, he has to pay for his crime. <coughs> against that young woman Shraddha. I don't think there's a single citizen in India who would disagree with that. But what is happening to women in this country? Every day, 86 women on an average are raped in this country. Every year, over 6,500 women are burned to death for dowry. In Assam itself, the National Family Health Survey states that the highest rate of women reporting domestic violence was in Mr. Assam Chief Minister's state. Are they all aftabs? Today the crime rate, conviction rate against women in India of crimes against them, including rape, 77% of the accused go free. There are hardly any convictions under the dowry laws. Today, 35 lakh cases of crimes against women are pending in the lower courts. 3 lakh cases of crimes against women are pending in the high court. You want to 
communalize crimes against women? Are these all aftabs? On the contrary, my dear friends, if you are not an aftab, you have every hope of going free. It's because Bilkis Balu's rapist killers were not after. It's because the heartless Dalit girl who was killed and raped, they happened to belong to the same upper caste as the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh. That is why every rule in the book was bent to try and exonerate them from that dreadful crime. So here is where we are in hate politics, my dear friends. Where the worst crimes against women or the crimes against Dalits, you communalize it. You look at the religious identity of the victim, you look at the religious identity of the accused, and then you decide whether you are going to take up the case or not. Why and how can India ever accept this? So in the implementation of the politics of hate, you have completely and utterly shown there are no betis for you to bajao with this kind of politics. And obviously, the vehicle for <coughs> politics of hate is and always has been hate speech. And as we know, I mean, my petition is pending since January 2020. In fact, in response to one of my petitions, one of the judges said, if they say and make an abuse with a smile, that cannot be considered hate speech. <laughs> so now, don't be surprised if you see all the Hindutva gentlemen smiling and saying, Hum to kala kumar So they're all free. So how do we bring all this together? All interlinked. Hate politics is not a goal in itself. Hate politics is towards a <coughs> bigger political goal. <coughs> And some of the ways that this is being taken forward is what I have tried to describe today. But how do we fight against it? And here's the thing. I mean, the bad news is that politics of hate is a reality. But the good news is that it can be defeated. It can be defeated. It can be defeated electorally, it can be defeated politically, it can be defeated socially. So when we talk about hate politics, we also have to give equal importance to the alternative visions we have, as opposed to the politics of hate. Within these four pillars which I have described, those are not sufficient. I mean, I'm a communist, and I've been introduced as one. So I know that the Constitution of India is a constitution which has provided for the growth of huge inequalities and injustices in India. And I know that whatever socialist or whatever the inklings of socialism are in the constitution are only in the directive principles which are not justiciable. And therefore I have many criticisms about this weak link in the Constitution of India. I want the right to work to be a fundamental right. I want the fight against inequalities to be fundamental and justiciable in the Constitution of India. I want that whatever socialists in the Constitution become part of the fundamental rights of the Constitution. But today, 
If I stand for the Constitution, if I say that the fight for an alternative vision which can go beyond the rights granted by the Constitution but must always defend with the last drop of our thinking, our blood, the principles and the values of equality, of secularism, of democracy. So develop our own visions. I don't think we can fight Hindutva politics by a softer version of Hindutva politics. I don't think so. I don't think you can give up hardcore secularism. How you express it is different. But once you agree to a platform which you yourself use religion for political purposes, you've lost half the battle. You can't fight on that toxic ground which the BJP and RSS have prepared in this country. You can fight on alternatives, on visions, and the people will listen. And for that we need unity. One of Saftar's huge contributions at that time was the way he built a bridge between intellectuals, thinkers, opinion makers, artists, and what Vishnu Priya has described as the people and the people's voices and the people's concerns. Saftar was the bridge. I mean, he was not, he, he believed in that bridge and he worked towards that bridge. And I think it is that, what Ejaz Ahmed described is a structure of solidarities. We need that structure of solidarity and each one of us has a role to play in it. Cultural artists, performers, we have to think of wider platforms in which you can draw in all those who have an important role to play in the resistance to the assault on culture in the name of Hindutva culture. How do we fight it? How do we bring in historians? How do we bring in writers? How do we expand this structure of solidarities? Don't look only to opposition parties for their unity. Opposition parties, political parties, have a responsibility to the citizens of this country to defeat the RSS and BJP in what they are doing to India. But we have to be the agents of resistance among the people where we work, where we live. Our relations with the people. And you are doing it. Jan Natya Manch and so many other groups, we are doing it. Let us see how today we can overcome whatever hurdles and barriers we have in our own work to build those wider and stru stronger structures of solidarity. I think solidarity with an alternative vision is what is going to prevent the achievement of the toxic goal. And I would say, I started off by saying the authoritarian regime. I added the corporate factor, the pro-corporate factor, so the authoritarian pro-corporate regime, and most importantly of all, the development of an identity based on the hate towards the minorities, the communal factor. So what we are resisting is a regime which is authoritarian, pro-corporate, and communal. And that is what we define as the purveyor of the politics of hate, using the avenues, the toxic words, which hurt more sometimes than bullets, which humiliate, which bully, which intimidate. And we are here, all of us together, to fight that. And as I said, the good news is that it can be fought. And the good news is 
they can be defeated. So once again, I pay my tribute to our dear, beloved comrades of the Hashmi. I thank my comrades in general for giving me this opportunity to speak today on this occasion. And I thank all of you for having the patience to listen to me. Thank you. After such a rich and inspiring talk, uh, we are open for questions. So, um, thank you, Comrade Karat, for this wonderful, very inspiring and rich talk. Um, we are open for questions. Would you have to answer? <laughs> Before the questions, I just wanted to add to something you said. <clears throat> Actually, <clears throat> the person we are talking about who sort of mouthed those hateful remarks in Delhi did not say it smilingly. But the judge, it was evident that he found a way out because that man did not say it smilingly. Even I'm that is about, uh, so that is the truth. We watched it live, so we know. So that was the, and you know, the, the gumption of the judge to actually, under pressure, of course he's under pressure, to find a way out was quite ridiculous. You know. So anyway. So. so questions, please. I have a question. Yes, yes. I belong to Kashmir. My did you have to stand up so people yes. in the back? So do you want to speak? No, I'm fine. Yeah. Uh, I belong to Kashmir. I am a Kashmiri Pandit, and my tribe faced violence at the hands of some people in Kashmir. So why not we talk about hatred from all sections of society, and why only we are criticizing Hindu for hatred? Sure, I can answer this. It was a very important point. There is no question about it. We unambiguously, unambiguously condemn in the strongest terms the violence which was unleashed against the Kashmiri Pandits, the displacement of the Kashmiri Pandits from their homeland, the torture and difficulties that the Kashmiri pundits have faced, have faced all these years. And we also say that the terrorists operating in the name of Islam who targeted the Kashmiri pundits, targeted along with them all secular-minded forces in the valley who supported the Kashmiri pundits and who were deadly opposed to the kind of Islamicist ideologies which were sought to be imposed on the people of Kashmir. And in fact, if one looks at those years, it's very clear that the Kashmiri pundits and the targeting of the Kashmiri pundits, which was their main aim, was accompanied by an equally vicious barbaric killing of all those who opposed terrorism. And then if one, of course, one cannot go by numbers of victims. I think that's, you know, I think that's a, a cruel thing to try and say that so many of the pundits were killed and so many of the Muslims were killed. But the fact of the matter is that there were a large number of those who are believers in Islam who also became the victims of those terrorists. And those terrorists had a political aim. And therefore, we condemn it in the strongest of terms. There's absolutely no two ways about it. I hope that answers it. And thank you for raising it. I think it was very important that you raised it. Extremely important. What is the ultimate aim of the uh, you know, uh, collaboration of BJP and Is serving any corporate family or any other thing? 
and how how any person can be so dedicated to a family, you know, like the highest post of the, you know, what kind? प्यार किसी के लिए और नफरत ज़्यादों के लिए ये ये है लेकिन मैंने जैसे कहा कि ये प्रो कॉर्पोरेट जो है ना ये पूंजीवादी ढांचा का एक हिस्सा है और हिंदुस्तान तो एक पूंजीवादी देश है तो उसमें अभी जो नीतियाँ चल रही है उसमें जो बहुत बड़े और अमीर लोग हैं जिसको कहते हैं दरबारी कैपिटलिस्ट का भी एक बड़ा सेक्शन बन गया है तो उनके आपस में ही मोदी जी और बीजेपी की जो नीति है मतलब ये तो हम कोई स्कैन करके तो नहीं देख सकते कि मोदी जी की हृदय अमित शाह की हृदय में कितना इसके लिए प्यार है या कितना उसके लिए प्यार है ये तो स्कैनिंग से नहीं होगा लेकिन नीतियों से होता है उनकी प्रॉफिट बैलेंस शीट से होता है कि कौन कौन इसमें सबसे फायदेमंद हुए हैं और उसमें अगर देखी जाए एक का तो बहुत अधिक हुआ है लेकिन आमतौर पर जो हिंदुस्तान की जनता कोविड के मार खा खा के आत्महत्या कर रहे थे वहाँ ये जो बड़े कॉपरेट्स है मोदी जी के सौजन्य से उनकी नीतियों की मेहरबानी से उनका प्रॉफिट शी बहुत आगे बढ़ गया तो ये पूंजीवाद का एक फंक्शन है और वो हिंदुत्व के एजेंडा के साथ उनका तालमेल है क्योंकि वो एजेंडा का लागू होता है तो वर्ग संघर्ष का जो मुद्दा है जनता की एकता की जो मुद्दा है जो उनको रेजिस्टेंस हो सकता है उनकी प्रो कॉर्पोरेट पॉलिसीज के खिलाफ वो भी कमजोर हो जाए किसानों के संघर्ष में देखो उन्होंने कितनी मदद कोशिश की जात के नाम पर धर्म के नाम पर तोड़ने के लिए लेकिन किसान टूटे नहीं अगर किसान टूटते तो फायदा वही बड़े कॉपरेट्स को होते जो पूरे कृषि क्षेत्र में घुस जाते तो ये सब इंटरमिंगल है इंटरलिंक्ड है लेकिन प्यार तो है या जो है वो पैसे का भी तो प्यारा में फंडामेंटल क्वेश्चन है कि वो पैसे ले आ रहे हैं जो हालात हैं ये जो कॉम्बिनेशन चल रहा है हालातों का ये कोई आज से तो पक नहीं रहे हैं एक बड़े लंबे अरसे से सन बाद में से बदले चला जा रहा है माहौल तो लेफ्ट की जो भूमिका होनी चाहिए थी वो लेफ्ट के स्पेक्ट्रम के ऊपर लेफ्ट से ही की जा सकती है कि वे सारे हालात को चैलेंज कर मगर लेफ्ट अपने आप में इतने बड़े दिखाव में है लेफ्ट के नाम पर ही बड़ी पार्टी है आज के वक्त में गुजरुआ पार्टियों के साथ आपके हम होते बराबर तो हैं तो आप क्या सिनेरियो देखते हैं इंडियन मास्टर्स के लिए कि ये कैसे चैनल को ऑफ करे नहीं आपकी बात आप आपकी बात बहुत प्रासंगिक है मैं इसलिए उसको प्रासंगिक समझती हूँ कि अगर आज के राजनीत को अगर हम विश्लेषण करते तो ये तो बिल्कुल स्पष्ट है कि अगर बगैर समझौता वाले कोई भी आज पॉलिटिकल फॉर्मेशन है वो लेफ्ट है जो बीजेपी और आरएसएस के एजेंडा के खिलाफ खुले रूप में उसका मुकाबला करे और कहीं कॉम्प्रोमाइज नहीं करे तो इसलिए लेफ्ट को किसी प्रकार कमज़ोर होना या लेफ्ट के अंदर बिखराव आना ये निश्चित रूप पर बीजेपी के खिलाफ जो आंदोलन है वो खुद ही कमज़ोर होता है तो ये हमारे सामने में एक बहुत बड़ा टास्क है एक तो जो इलेक्ट्रल हमारी पोजिशन है इसमें कोई दो बात नहीं हो सकती है राय नहीं हो सकती है कि पिछले 2011 से जब बंगाल की सरकार का हमारा वो वहाँ हमारा डिफीट हुआ तो इलेक्ट्रल तरीके से हमारी कमजोरी बन गई है और जब इलेक्ट्रल फ्रंट पर या पार्लियामेंट फ्रंट पर एक पूरा पॉलिटिकल फॉर्मेशन की प्रतिनिधित्व कमज़ोर होती है तो नेचुरली आम परसेप्शन होता है कि लेफ्ट कहाँ है तो इलेक्ट्रल के साथ साथ अगर हम अन्य क्षेत्रों को देखते हैं संघर्षों के क्षेत्र को जनता को लामबंद करने के क्षेत्र को अगर हम किसानों के संघर्ष देखते हैं मजदूरों के संघर्ष देखते हैं तो निश्चित रूप पर लेफ्ट वहाँ एक प्रमुख भूमिका अदा कर रही है जो एंटी बीजेपी आरएसएस की व्यापक आंदोलन में उसका एक महत्व है लेकिन आपकी जो सवाल है उसको हम कैसे उसको ओवरकम करें निश्चित रूप पर ये हमारे सामने बड़ा टास्क है टाइम 
we have many writers and uh, theater persons, the other groups affiliated to or having sympathy for the left cause. Progressive Writers Association, Janwadi Lekhak Sangh, all of them. But the problem of fragmentation of left in particular is that it has been seen in many places. In many places? It has been seen in many places. It has been seen in many places. It has been seen in Progressive Writers Association, it has been seen in many places, it has been seen in many places. अब जबकि इतनी बड़ी समस्या है और कई लोग मैं लिटरेचर की दुनिया की बात ही कर रहा हूँ लिटरेचर और आर्ट की बात कर रहा हूँ कई लोग जो ट्रेडिशनली प्रो लेफ्ट कभी नहीं रहे आज वो लोग भी शायद मुझे लगता है नाम नबीन को लोग समझ जाएंगे वो खड़े होकर उन्होंने अपने अवार्ड भी लौट आए एक स्टैंड भी लिया कि हम कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के लिए या देश के भविष्य के लिए इसका विरोध करते तो एक व्यापक कल्चरल राइटर्स का आर्टिस्ट का एक फ्रंट बने जहां पर कि ये जो छोटे छोटे डिविजन हैं जिनके पर बहुत कुछ कहा जा सकता है उनसे उनसे कैसे पार पाया जाए और दूसरी चीज ये है कि जो हम पढ़ते हैं रूस सोवियत यून का भी पढ़ते हैं कि जो पॉलिटिकल लीडरशिप और इंटेलेक्चुअल्स थे उनके बीच जिस तरह की एक रिलेशनशिप थी वो रिलेशनशिप क्या हमारे देश में हम अचीव कर पाए हैं और अगर नहीं कर पाए तो हम तो क्या कर सकते हैं? देखिए मैं बहुत हूँ कोई बिल्कुल ठोस इसमें कोई जवाब देने की क्योंकि कैसे मतभेद है किस रूप में मतभेद है ये मैं कोई कॉन्क्रीटली नहीं कह सकती हूँ लेकिन जो मैंने कहा जो मेरी बुनियादी ये समझ है कि जब तक हम ये एकजुटता के ढांचा को नहीं बनाएंगे जो अलग अलग ग्रुप्स को इकट्ठा करके एक प्लेटफॉर्म उपलब्ध करती देखिए हो सकता है कि जो व्यक्तिगत मतभेद है वो रह भी जाए मतलब अगर हम सोचे कि हर चीज को हम एकदम इसमें जो है मिटा देंगे शायद वो प्रैक्टिकल कितने हैं मैं नहीं कह सकती हूँ लेकिन ये सिर्फ प्रैक्टिकल नहीं ये बचने या बचाने के लिए ये अनिवार्य है कि इस प्रकार का एक जुटता के ढांचा को अलग अलग क्षेत्र में इंक्लूडिंग वो तमाम हिस्सों जिसके बारे में आपने जिक्र किया है वो निश्चित रूप पर बनना चाहिए और मैं तो चाहूँगी जो यहाँ हमारे साथी हैं विशेषकर क्योंकि मैं जननाट्य मंच और हमारे लेखक संघ और और भी सांस्कृतिक जो तमाम हमारे संगठन के साथ हमको जुड़े हैं ये मैसेज निश्चित रूप पर उनके पास पहुंचा है और भी पहुंचाएंगे और रिश्तों और मजबूत बनाने के लिए हम जरूर प्रयास करेंगे मैं सिर्फ एक लास्ट बात कहना चाहती हूँ विष्णु प्रिया जी से इजाजत लेकर के अभी ये पठान के बारे में जो कुछ हो रहा है और अभी जो ये नरोत्तम मिश्रा ने जो कुछ किया मुझे पता नहीं ये कहना चाहिए कि नहीं लेकिन सब कंटेमिनेटेड माइंड इतने हैं कि बुलडोजर लेकर वो कहीं मध्य प्रदेश के खजुराव में ही ना पहुंचे कि वो भी कंटेमिनेटेड माइंड का जो है ना वो क्या दृश्य देखेगा उसका ये हम कह नहीं सकते लेकिन है लेकिन मैं ये कहना चाहती हूँ कि आज इस अवसर पर मैं जरूर ये कहना चाहती हूँ कि उनका जो हमला है उनके जो मतलब दुस्साहस रहा कि वो बोले कि इसके कपड़े गलत है उसके कपड़े गलत है और बाद में आर्मी ऑफ ट्रोल्स खड़े होकर बोलते हैं कि अगर पठान का शब्द इस्तेमाल करना है तो देशभक्ति उसके साथ नहीं जुड़ सकती है और पूरा ट्रोलिंग हो रहा बैन करने के लिए मैं समझती हूँ आज की इस बहस में हम सब एक मिलकर एक साथ कहें कि शाहरुख खान और दीपिका पदुकोण के ऊपर पठान के ऊपर मैंने हालांकि फिल्म नहीं देखी अच्छी है कि बुरी है लेकिन निश्चित रूप पर हाँ अभी रिलीज नहीं हुआ लेकिन मैंने वो भी देखा है लेकिन मैं कहना चाहती हूँ ये सिलेक्टिव मॉडल पुलिसिंग और ये कम्युनल टारगेटिंग ये भी कम्युनल टारगेटिंग आमिर खान की फिल्म के साथ क्या हुआ ये खुले आम नए मकाथिज्म दिखाई दे रहा है इधर तो इसलिए हमें एक साथ मिलकर एक जुटता प्रकट करना चाहिए 
और इस नरोत्तम मिश्रा की जो बयान है उसकी सब निंदा भी आज हम करते हैं डेफिनेशन ऑफ It is defined the idea of um, the violence which comes out of such hate speeches in the United Nations. Sort of definition, it's local, regional, uh, sort of applications, particularly in contemporary India, and how this has got sort of imbibed within the power structure, and how hate politics is threatening the very edifice of democracy and citizenship in India, and to actually. Uh, Uh, you know uh, propagate that to take it forward it has to sort of destroy some of the very uh, foundational tenets of our constitution article 14 15 the um, sort of category of secularism and many such provisions she went on to talk about how the state machinery brings about um, you know fundamentalism and i think that's why she answered your <coughs> question so aptly that any kind of fundamentalism actually sort of uh, adds to these power structure and their sort of form of violence they want you know fundamentalism at all levels islamophobia and breaking up in communal sort of lines is one of the major ones and how uh, intellectual thoughts academic curriculum are sort of colonized to serve the purpose um as she talked about how also um certain pluralities and heterogeneity is sort of um subverted to create this idea of homogeneity and the very complex idea that you know how do you bring in caste divides within this idea of a perverted hindu universal as uh, universalism and a sort of hindu unity um as a very important marxist analysis i thought where she pushed the sort of you know caste issues and divides is looking at it through the lens of class it has very strong class connotations the underpinnings of the class identity is something if we deny it you know we will never be able to create a resistance against it she went on to talk about um sort of this culture of hate and i think you know when we talk about the politics against hate it is important to lay out the field to lay out a consciousness which allows us then to sort of counter it and how this sort of you know these uh, spectacles of lynching spectacles of you know uh, communal violence are unleashed in the public domain and how it sort of ties up with political economy the very complex issue of sexual violence and how the power structure uses it and how it has a whole other domain which sort of uh, reveals the fissures and the cracks um then what i think was very important for all of us who are in the field of culture and you know cultural practice particularly left cultural practices is <coughs> what is our role and she talked about you know how it has affected the left electorally politically socially and then she came to this very important field in the terms of culture and how do we sort of promote the alternative visions how do we bring back the idea of secularism and how theater cultural you know sort of practices music dance how they can all sort of you know build these bridges help us to create this culture of resistance um uh, i think also as you know we were saying to people who um have given up their prizes have also sort of made of you know sort of objected to this culture of hate how we can sort of create different networks of solidarity and i really want to say from my perspective that you know this hindutva is also unleashing a very dangerous culture which we say is populist and comrade karat kept on emphasizing that what the left needs to do 
is not fall into that trap of populism. Despite some very important, you know, critical thinkers like Chantal Mouffe, who says that left must also have, you know, a left populism, a communist populism. And uh, like uh, I do believe, and I think Janam also believes, the progressive left cultural movement also believes, that we can't. Our vision is an alternative. And that is where we build up our sort of resistance through cultural practices. So I thank Comrade Brinda Karat for this very inspiring talk, which we think will lead us forward. How do we create a culture against hate? And I thank Janam, Comrade Malashri Hashmi, all the members of Janam for taking the um, work forward, which is a very difficult, dormitable task, which we have to do. And thank you to all of you for being here.